Welcome to Hope Today. I'm Tom Hollis. This is Amy Schaefer. I want to tell you that God is faithful. No matter what you're going through today, He has hope for you and His hope for you today. We're so glad you joined us. We've got a big show for you. We've got a fantastic guest and fantastic time of ministry for you. Tell us about it, Amy. Oh, I cannot wait for our guest today and this conversation. You know, are you asking questions and wondering what is God's calling for the church in America today? And are you wondering what are three lessons from history or particularly Bonhoeffer, his teachings that apply to us today? Or do you ever wonder about religious leaders and their silence on political issues? I love this topic. And our next guest, Eric Metaxas, tackles these questions in his new book, Religionless Christianity, God's Answer to Evil. Tom, this, this will be a robust, wonderful conversation. It's going to apply to all of us as believers and the church today. Yeah. And it's exciting. Well, it's, and it's not just a conversation, but it's something that moves us to action, yes. doesn't it? And that's really what we expect today. We're going to learn how to live out our faith with boldness. We're going to find out what God's calling is for the church in, in America during this time in history. And we'll also be praying for Israel at the end of the program. So uh, a full show. Uh, we also, we've got a lot of, a lot of little uh, <laughs> housekeeping things this yeah. morning. We want, you, we want to, you to find out how you can win a pair of tickets to see Amy Grant. And that's coming up. Uh, we'll tell you about that in a little bit. I grew up on Amy Grant. <laughs> She's such a pioneer and world changer. And also I want to mention that we have new times for hope today. Beginning Monday, April the 29th, our new times will be at 3.30 p.m., 8 p.m., and 1 a.m. in the morning. Hard questions will be on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. and Sister to Sister. My personal favorite will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 a.m. So, Tom, change is good. A lot of moving change parts. Change is good, it's yeah. Really and my good. personal favorite is hard questions, so, <laughs> <laughs> which I host. So, uh, uh, just want, one more thing we wanted to mention before we bring Eric in is that we had a fundraiser last week. Some of you uh, saw that. We had a goal of 200000 The total raised was $167,268.39. So, Praise the Lord for that. Thank you so much, all of you who participated. And by the way, if you didn't participate, you can see we had a little bit of a shortfall there. Maybe it's time for you uh, to get involved and get in, in the ball game here at Cornerstone because we know if you're watching now, we know that you're ministered to and blessed and so many are by this, uh, by this ministry. So please uh, be involved and remember to pray for us too. It's important. Amy. Our next guest is calling on believers to not just practice their faith, but to actually live it out. Eric Metaxas is a New York Times best-selling author and the host of the nationally syndicated Eric Metaxas radio show. His new book just came out and is called Religionless Christianity, God's Answer to Evil. He joins us now to help us better understand what God wants us to do before it's too late for both the church and for America. Eric, thank you for joining us on Hope Today. Privilege to be with you. Thank you. Eric, let's dive in first of all to this topic, to this title of your book, Religionless Christianity. Who said that and what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's a weird title. It's the weirdest title I've ever had, but um, it comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was trying to figure out at the end of his life, he, was, he wrote a letter from prison to his best friend, Eberhard Beidke. And in the letter, he said, in a sense, what happened that evil took over Germany? Now, he knew what happened. He knew that the church had stepped aside. The church had said, oh, this is not our job. We don't want to get political. And evil rose and destroyed that nation and destroyed literally millions of lives. So Bonhoeffer knew that. But he then says what we needed in Germany to fight evil was a religionless Christianity. And it's a strange Bonhoeffer term, but it sums up the idea that mere religion and religiosity, going to church, going through the motions, liturgy, whatever it is, is useless if you don't live it out. In other words, if you're not really living your faith, all the religiosity is, is almost judgment against you rather than for you. Because who were the most wicked people in Jesus's day were the religious leaders. And so if you are very religious, 
but you are ignoring the one thing that God puts in front of you to do, you are more guilty than the pagans. And so Bonhoeffer makes this case all through his writings. And in my book, Religionless Christianity, I trace this idea from when he was a very young man. He was he was on to this. It's kind of like pushing Jesus out of the faith, uh, uh, pushing the, the person of God out of the faith and just going through the motions of religiosity all the way up to the, literally the end of his life when he writes this phrase, from prison. He's, he's uh, going to his death. And it really sums up where we are in the American church right now. You have many, many Christian leaders saying we shouldn't get involved politically. Trust me, that is nonsense. It is biblical garbage. It's, it's absolutely not biblical at all. Um, and it's historically verifiably nonsense because Christians got political. We, we brought about the abolitionist movement. Christians abolished slavery. Christians abolished the slave trade. Uh, the civil rights movement came out of the churches. Christians are supposed to be political. We're not supposed to make an idol of politics, but we're supposed to do everything we can, including use our freedoms and the political process for God's purposes. So this book really is the sequel to my book, Letter to the American Church, where I basically make the same case. And, you know, when we say the time is urgent, it could not be more urgent. There's nothing I could possibly say to underscore more that we are, we have months in a sense. If enough in, in the church do not wake up, we will lose this nation. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I challenge people on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you would have to be dead not to be concerned about the state of America or, you know, the church in America. I actually have your book with me, Letters to the American Church, which I gave to every pastor I know and into our church congregation. You had some statistics in that book that really, I think, apply to where we're at today in your new book, Religionless Christianity. And you talk about, was it 18,000 churches in Germany? Yeah during World War II, Hitler's in charge. What did those churches do or not do? Well, this is the nightmare, right? Because we always talk about, oh, we're not going to a woke church. Well, you know what? That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Here's the issue. In Germany, there were, let's say, 18,000 pastors, right? 3,000 were heroes. 3,000 were with Bonhoeffer willing to stand up as total Christians to stand against the evil of the Nazis. The pressure was huge. You talk about cancel culture. You talk about threats to lose your job, go to a concentration camp, have the FBI knock down your door, whatever you want to call it. The threats were huge. 3,000 stood firm as real Christians of the 18,000. On the other end of the spectrum, you have 3,000 who were totally woke in that time, right? Totally for Hitler, completely apostate. But here's the point. In the middle were 12 thousand pastors who said, you know what? We don't need to choose. We don't want to be like those hotheads like Bonhoeffer. Uh, he, he's too zealous. Uh, that We just want to do church. We just want to have a nice church service, worship the Lord, sing our hymns. We don't want to get involved. It was those 12,000 who thought they were in the middle, but who were working for the devil, let's be clear, by being in the middle, by not standing with the 3,000 heroes, they may as well have been with the pro-Nazi pastors. By doing nothing, they open the door to satanic evil. This is where we are in America. We have innumerable churches that they say, oh, we're preaching the gospel, blah, 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 blah. They are not doing what is necessary, what the Holy Spirit is saying we ought to do to stand against satanic evil. And everywhere we look, there is satanic evil evil, uh, I don't need to mention it, everywhere we look in this nation, satanic evil has risen up. We have innumerable strangers, military age men pouring across an open border. Uh, we have transgender lunacy, destroying lives, ripping uh, kids away from their parents. We have big government uh, crushing uh, biblical values, trying to crush people who stand up for the ordered liberty uh, won by patriots uh, over the decades. If you do not stand against this and your church doesn't stand against this, you're like one of the 12,000 that says, oh, we're, we're on the fence. The devil owns the fence. And there are many Christians who need to wake up to this immediately. I say, if you're going to a church that's not taking a stand, that's not in this battle, you're, the time is to get out of that church yesterday, not in a month, not in two months. Get out, take your money. If you knew where things were going, if you knew, if you were in a German church 
and the Nazis were taking power. You knew you had like a year maybe to take a bold stand or it's going to be over. They didn't take a bold stand. They waited. It was game over. And then when they woke up, it was too late. That's where we are in America. And in both books, I go into that. Letter to the American Church. We've made a documentary film, which people can see at lettertotheamericanchurch.com. And then the sequel is Religionless Christianity, where I go further uh, into uh, how this applies to us today. Eric, I wanted to bring in a, another uh, person from that time, Martin Niemöller. You have a, a chapter about him. Could you uh, just... Uh, he was another one in uh, contemporary Bonhoeffer during that yeah. time. Can you kind of just draw some lessons from what happened to him? Well, Niemöller is the nightmare story because he was a good man, a patriotic German, fought in the First World War, was uh, uh, awarded uh, the, uh, the Iron Cross for bravery. Now that the Nazis are rising, and he, like many Christians today, say, you know what, we can, uh, we can work with, with Hitler. He's, he's not so bad. We don't want to take sides politically. And, and, and we believe that he's reasonable and we can work with him. Well, now we kind of laugh at that, right? Well, many people are saying that, you know, about the Biden administration, about the globalists, like, it's not so bad. Why are you getting so excited about all these things? That There's two sides to the story. Niemöller was the classic case. He said, listen, um, I think we can be reasonable. I, I, I have met with Hitler. He gave me promises. He gave me promises in person that he would leave the church alone, that he would not come after Christians, that they would not have pogroms on the Jews. He gave me his word. Well, Hitler gets into power and does everything that he said he wouldn't do. And Niemöller is thinking, oh, he's got bad people around him. It's not Hitler. If I can have a meeting with Hitler. Well, he finally, finally, finally gets a meeting with Hitler. And in that meeting, Hitler reveals precisely his view of the church, his view of the church which is the view of the church of all authoritarian regimes, including leftists in our country right now, is that the church gets in the way. We need to sideline the church. We need to silence the church, keep the church sitting there, sleeping, because if the church wakes up, we're over. We can't do this. So Niemöller goes into the meeting with Hitler. Hitler immediately has a transcript of, of, of a tapped phone call, and they read it in front of Niemöller to humiliate him, to silence him. And then Hitler says, you just worry about your sermons. And you can see the sneering thing. In other words, your little religious sermons, they have nothing to do with what we want to do. Just preach your little sermons and shut up. And when you leave church on Sunday morning, you bow to the authority of the Third Reich. That's where we are today. That's where you are in China. You, you can have your little church service right. as long as you don't comment on the evil being done by the government, as long as you don't talk about these controversial things. That church is not the church. That church is the devil's church. And, and Niemöller finally wakes up. And by the time he woke up, it was too late. He had dithered. He had waited. So he was very brave after that. But he really couldn't do anything after that. If he had woken up in the beginning, he could have joined Bonhoeffer. And they could have actually stood against the evil of the Nazis. But they, they only had a short window. And I, and I make the parallel to where we are today that if the church is silent, if the church is sleeping, if the church says, well, we don't want any trouble, we'll let the other churches get in trouble. They're kind of, you know, oh, they're, those are Christian nationalists. They're always talking about politics. Well, I'm here to tell you, folks, the parallels, when you read what happened in Germany, it is absolutely chilling, and the hour is late in America. I give all kinds of examples in the book because uh, I want those who can wake up to wake up. Uh, if, you, if you sleep another few months, it is over. Uh, so this is... Not, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, dramatic, except th this is reality. This is where we are in America. You know, silence and inaction just doesn't go hand in hand with being a believer, a Christian, a follower of Christ. But if a pastor does stand up and say something, there is this spirit of the age of cancel culture. You've dedicated right. two chapters in this book on cancel yeah. culture. Can you address that? And how do we push through that fear? Well, cancel culture is, it's a, it's a demonic spirit. You see it in the French Revolution. You see it in the Bolshevik Revolution. It's an atheistic, uh, demonic spirit that hates truth, hates God, hates the people of God. And it manifests at different times. And we've seen it in our time. We call it cancel culture. And it comes after anyone that gets out of line. But any pastor that fears that is not fearing God. Right. Uh, the Lord doesn't call us to a spirit of fear. 
He calls us to trust him boldly. And I think what we're seeing in these times is you're seeing how many people who talk about being Christians, talk about having faith, when push comes to shove, they don't. They say, well, what does my congregation think? I'm going to lose some people. This is the time for Christians to stand with everything you have. If you lose people, God will make it up to you. If you lose money, God will make it up to you. If we don't stand now, uh, if we're looking at circumstances, we are no better than the German pastors who allowed satanic evil to destroy millions of lives. I want to be very clear. God is a judge, and he will judge us for our fear, for our fear of man, for our fear of losing tides, for our fear of whatever it is. The Lord calls us to boldly stand. And by the way, he will be with us. We will find courage when we step out in faith. These aren't cliches. This is how uh, it works when you walk with God. You have to actually trust him, not just talk about trusting him, but you have to actually trust him and see that he is good. Eric, it reminds me of something my dad said as I was leaving home to go with my husband and plant and pioneer a church here in the in the Northeast. He said, Amy, you cannot have the backbone of a cotton string. And I think that is a word for pastors today. This is not the time for you to have a backbone of a cotton string. It is time to be strong, be bold, stand up and speak truth. But one final question, because you actually answer this question in your book. Eric, are we approaching the end of time? Well, there's no doubt about that. The question is, what is our job and what can we do? Uh, anybody who thinks Jesus is going to come soon, therefore do nothing, that is the devil speaking. I want to be clear. We are to work hard to do everything we can do for God's purposes until the Lord comes. So anybody who says, oh, it's, we're under judgment, therefore do nothing, that's the devil. That is absolutely uh, what we ought not to do. We ought to fight with everything we have for God's purposes, and he will decide. Th there is a spirit of globalism. I talk in, the, there's a chapter about the Tower of Babel, the idea of all of mankind uniting essentially against God. It's a satanic project, and religion without Jesus is a satanic project. Even if you use the name Jesus, the point is that if you're not living in, in what God has called you to do, the way Bonhoeffer did, and I, and, I, and I make clear in the book how Bonhoeffer did it, so we have a model uh, of not being lured into worshiping religious idols when we're supposed to be worshiping the Lord. But I have to be clear that we are in the last days, and, and I think these things have gotten worse to wake up the church. And I think the Lord is trying to wake up the church. And I say this also clearly, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to a church that is playing patty cake with the devil, that, that pretends that you don't need to get involved. You're guilty. You need to get out of that church. You need to repent. There are many people playing church. They say, we want to have a nice church service. That is exactly what the Germans did. Many good pastors and good Christians got it wrong, and they allowed evil to triumph. There are many Americans going to churches like that, and I beg you, as my brothers and sisters in Christ, to take this seriously, to get out of those churches, to find churches that are in the game, that are in the battle, a uh, letter to the American church makes this clear. Religionless Christianity kind of gives the how-to. And the film, Letter to the American Church, anybody can see the film, letter to the American church.com is the website. Uh, it, it, it really is a call to action. If you are not in the fight, you are like those 12,000 pastors that sat on the fence, thought they were safe, thought they were neutral, but they were actually serving the devil by being asleep, by being on the sidelines. It's kind of a nightmare. But I believe the Lord's using these things to wake us up, to get us out of the nightmare and to say, I'm going to be part of what God wants to do in this generation so that we do not go down the path of the German church. We are right at the edge. Uh, we don't have three years. Uh, we're right at the edge. And I want, to, I want to say this as urgently as possible to people who are listening. Eric, what is the hope today for America and the church? Well, the hope is always the same hope, right? That, that the people who love God or claim to love God would actually love him and serve him fearlessly. As if you were uh, in a country where Christianity was bitterly persecuted, you would say, I'm going to stand for God. I believe him. I believe him when he says he, de he defeated death on the cross. He really did. And so therefore, even if you kill me, you can't kill me. Bonhoeffer had that attitude. If you live that way, you live bravely, 
But really the joy is that's the way you were created to live exactly the, that way. And anything else is kind of a nightmare. We need to step out in faith. And I actually believe we might not only di avert disaster, but we might see a blooming of Christian faith in a way we never have. So this is the hour of the American church. It's time to wake up. And I hope that these two books will uh, enable enough people to do that before it's too late. Amen. I love on the cover of your book, it says there is only one hope left to save America and the world. Active, robust, and public faith in God. Thank you, Eric, for being our guest today. Thank you for your incredible voice. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for this uh, Letters to the American Church and Religionless Christianity. God bless you, Eric. Peace be with you as you go into the dark world and bring the light. God bless you. Thank you. When we return in 60 seconds, learn how you can win tickets to see an upcoming Amy Grant concert. Plus, we will be praying for Israel and sharing our final thoughts from today's program. We'll be right back. God is calling you to do something significant in the earth for Him, regardless of your age, skill set, or perceived limitations. What's holding you back? When you give to support Cornerstone Television this month, let us bless you with Rick Renner's life-transforming book, Chosen by God. Every page will help you overcome your limited thinking and follow God's plan for your life. Rest assured, God has a plan and he will thoroughly prepare you to fulfill it if you'll say yes with all your heart. This book will thrill you with the possibilities that await because you are chosen by God. Request your copy when you give by calling 888-665-4483 or donate online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for helping us spread the gospel through life-changing programming like Rick Renner, Hope Today, Hard Questions, and more. To keep your favorite programs coming and receive Chosen by God, donate today. Ba, ba, ba. Hey, stump the <laughs> viewer. Uh, on yesterday's program, we had a stump the viewer question for everyone. And in case you missed it, here's the question we ask you. How does 2 Timothy describe the last days? Is it A, perilous, B, scary, C, supernatural, or D, confusing? If you know the answer, go to ctvn.org slash stump and select what you think it is. One randomly selected person who guesses correctly, I want to make that <laughs> part of the, who guesses correctly will receive a pair of tickets to see the upcoming Amy Grant concert in Munhall, PA on May the 14th. The winner will be announced on Friday's Hope Today. So remember, if you know the answer, go to ctvn.org slash stump to participate. That's great, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> we also have a Jerusalem Dateline that will be airing on Wednesdays at 10 p.m. and Saturdays at 3 p.m. It's going to be a great new program for us oh, to really be tied into what yes, God is doing, doing from a Israel. biblical perspective in Israel and the Middle East and the whole uh, Jerusalem region. So, uh, I mean, that's something we need to be aware of as we, we've talked and mm -hmm. prayed, but we can get away from it, can't we? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, I mean, so much is happening in Israel. So many attacks. Um, it's amazing that there were like how many thousands of missiles launched at Israel. And did you know that every single one of them was yeah. detonated? Yeah. Yeah. Well, every I think one, one, one got through, wasn't it? And the no, one... no one was hurt. It was amazing. And it's just a you miracle. Know, it, it's a, it is amazing a to see that that level of technology too, yeah. to be able to do that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, we should pray for them. Yes. Pray for the peace of Israel. Us? There's a great scripture in Isaiah 62, six and seven. It says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her 
the praise of the earth. So right now, we just pray in Jesus' name for the peace of Israel. Father, I thank you that there are watchmen on the wall. I thank you there will be safety within her walls. God, I thank you for wise strategies at those in the top of government. I thank you for wise strategies in the church, for the believers. God, strengthen the believers, protect the believers, protect your people. And God, this land that you yourself made a covenant with, you made a covenant with the very dirt and land of Israel. They are your people. And Father, we will give ourselves no rest and we will give you no rest until you establish her as the praise of the earth. So we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So continue to pray for Israel. Continue to pray for that situation. Continue to pray for Palestine and the Palestinians. God loves them too. It's just that, you know, we get in these situations where uh, wars, war is part, uh, unfortunately, of what we see in our, uh, just this world that we live in. But trust in God that he has a plan and purpose for Israel. He has a plan and purpose for you as well. So what were your thoughts on well, I mean, Eric, are you fired up? I feel like uh, I'm ready for action. Yes. I mean, one of the things that we always believe here at Cornerstone is that we need to take strong stands on political issues that sometimes are called political issues. Sometimes they're called social issues or various issues that affect uh, us that we know that there's a biblical stance on. And sometimes that's not popular. We're not going to take a political side, but we're going to take a strong stand on truth. Well, they've taken biblical truths and biblical values and they've twisted them and made them political. Yeah, right. So, I, I mean, but that one quote by Adolf Hitler, I mean, should, should wreck you. He said, I built the Third Reich, you just worry about your sermons. And it's wow. like, we cannot let evil drive the narrative of the church or silence the church or silence the voice of Christians. This is not the time to be whiny and puny and, and, and hiding and tucking away and, and silent and no action. I mean, this is, this is the time that you were born for. You were born like Esther for such a time as this. This is not a fearful thing. This is like, this is who we are. This is what we do. We're Christians. We're followers of Christ. We stand for the truth. We believe that he was born of a virgin. He died and he rose again. And he said, I'm going to leave my power with the church. And that's you. And that gives you hope for today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, discover and complete your faith-filled assignment before Christ's return. Colonel David Jamona and Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist Troy Anderson encourage you to use the gifts and abilities God has given you to make a difference in the world. That's tomorrow on Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.